And to do this, Kepler ended up viewing this one region of the, um, of the galaxy um, that you can see right here, just outside, just in the constellation of Cygnus. Um, and if we actually zoom in on this region, um, we can see here um, that there are hundreds of thousands of stars on the Kepler CCDs. And to detect planets around these stars, um, Kepler ended up measuring the brightnesses of each of these stars consistently over roughly a four year time scale. And so whenever there were these um, periodic dips occurring around a particular star, um, Kepler would then measure effectively the relative size of the planet to the star through the transit method. Um, and over time, Kepler ended up discovering thousands of planets um, that you can see here. Um, this is as of December 14th, 2017. And this is a plot of size of the planet relative to the Earth on the y-axis versus orbital period on the x-axis. And all the yellow points that you can see in the center here are those that were discovered by Kepler. Now, what you'll notice is that the vast majority of these planets are between the size of Earth and the size of Neptune. Um, and this is particularly interesting because we don't have any analogs for these planets within our own solar system. And so therefore, you know, figuring out exactly what's going on with these planets is obviously a very interesting scientific pursuit. But then you'll also notice here that I've plotted this kind of white bar here, which was the typical uncertainty as of this time for each of these planets. So determining their exact properties was definitely difficult. And this was actually limited by the precision of the Kepler um, stellar properties at the time. So to just kind of give a brief introduction and uh, some background on the evolution of Kepler stellar properties, um, the first thing I want to talk about is the Kepler input catalog, which is detailed in Brown et al. 2011. Now, the major purpose of the Kepler input catalog was for target selection for the Kepler mission. And so there wasn't a very strong emphasis on just determining very precise stellar properties. And so therefore, because most of the constraints were only photometric, the median fractional stellar radius precision was about 40 or so percent for this catalog. Now, fortunately, there's been a bunch of additional work done on Kepler stellar properties in the subsequent years in the various Kepler stellar properties catalogs, um, the first of which uh, was detailed in Huber et al. 2014, and then a follow-up in Mathur et al. 2017. And what these papers did was wrap in all the additional information that we knew about stars within the Kepler field, um, including, for instance, the astroseismic analysis of light curves, as well as the um, spectroscopic follow-up done by ground-based surveys. And the combination of all those factors allowed the authors to get down to median fractional radius precisions of about 25 or so percent. But still, the vast majority of stars only had photometric constraints at this time. So how do we fix that problem? Well, fortunately, um, Gaia DR2 ended up dropping in April 2018. Um, and so with Gaia, we now have parallaxes and therefore can infer distances to over 1.5 billion stars, which includes the vast majority of the stars within the Kepler field. Now, this equation down here is the Stefan Boltzmann law, which I've solved for the radius of the star. And before Gaia DR2, we had relatively good constraints on things such as the bolometric flux and the effective temperature. However, we did not have very good constraints on the distances because we didn't have parallaxes. But thanks to um, Gaia DR2, we can now finally constrain those distances. So where does that put us? Well, here is what we end up getting out with the Gaia Kepler HR diagram showing about 178,000 stars. This is a plot of stellar radius versus effective temperature. And thanks to Gaia DR2, this allowed us to get down to median fractional radius precisions of about 8%, which is a factor of three or so better than what we were getting um, before Gaia DR2. And with these very precise stellar radii, this then allowed us to classify the percentage of Kepler stars that were main sequence dwarfs, making up roughly two thirds of the Kepler target sample, um, subgiants making up another 21 or so percent, and then red giants making up the final 12 or so percent. Now you might have noticed that there appears to be the secondary main sequence going on here for cool stars. So it turns out that these are actually likely main sequence binaries because these stars have not had enough time within the age of the universe to evolve to such large radii. And then you might also notice that there appears to be this gap in the distribution of effective temperatures. And this is just because we took our effective temperatures straight from Mathur et al. 2017. 
And the authors in that paper ended up using diverging effective temperature scales, which separated effectively the M dwarfs um, and the K dwarfs there. And so you see that gap at about 4,100 or so Kelvin. Okay, so how do these revised stellar radii actually affect the properties of the exoplanets that we observe? So here is the way things looked before Gaia DR2. Um, so this is a plot of planet radius versus incident flux. Um, incident flux increasing from right to left here. The red points are confirmed planets and the black points are candidate planets. And what you'll notice is overall, there appears to be a, a rather large blob of planets between the size of roughly the Earth and five times the size of Earth. Um, and then you can also see in general, the typical uncertainties based on the um, plotted error bars underneath. But how do things change when we implement Gaia DR2 parallaxes? Well, we see that things sharpen up very nicely here. And I'm going to flip back once more. What you'll also be able to notice is that the points kind of appear to systematically shift up and to the left um, when we make this change. And this is actually due to the fact that we ended up detecting more subgiant stars after Gaia DR2 parallaxes than we had previously seen before. Um, and so this actually causes points to shift up and to the left in this diagram because both the star's radius is increasing, which would then result in an increase of the planet radius with the same RP over our star value. And um, the incident flux will also increase because the star is increasing in size and therefore increases the luminosity of the star. Um, but what you'll notice is this is two separate distributions of planets now. The super Earths down below are separated from the sub-Neptunes up above. And this is also where we see the planet radius gap, um, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. Um, and I will be discussing that in more detail a little bit later. With Gaia DR2, this also allowed us to update the census of planets within the, the habitable zone. And so now we, we um, count 34 confirmed and 109 planet candidates in the habitable zone. Now it turns out that these numbers are actually slightly smaller than what, what we were getting beforehand. And a lot of that is due to this systematic shift up and to the left of points in this diagram. And then you might have also noticed that there appears to be a pretty clear hot Jupiter inflation trend going on for some of these more massive planets up above. Um, now these planets are massive enough to actually hold on to their atmospheres. So we don't have to worry about them losing their atmospheres at high incident fluxes. Okay, so I think we can all agree that these revised radii are great, um, but we do want to know additional information about Kepler stars, such as the masses and ages. So here is the way things looked back in 2017 with the Methorodal isochrone modeled stellar radii and effective temperatures. Um, what you might notice is that there's clearly latching on to a grid of models here for hot stars. The red clump is not very well defined. There aren't too many subgiant stars here. And then there's also this gap in the distribution of effective temperatures. How do things change when we implement Gaia DR2 parallaxes as well as a uniform effective temperature scale? Well, we see that things sharpen up very nicely here. Um, what you'll notice is that, you know, there's no longer a clear latching on to a set of grid models because we have more finely um, determined them. In addition, um, you'll note that the red clump is very well defined. There are more subgiant stars, and then we no longer see this gap in the distribution of effective temperatures for cool stars. Now, how exactly did we create this plot? So we used a combination of input um, SDSSG and two mass K photometry with um, reddening corrections. Um, in addition, we use Gaia DR2 parallaxes, and then we use spectroscopic metallicities wherever we had them, which comprises roughly about a third of the sample of Kepler stars. In addition, the, the model grid that we actually use to do this isochrone placement um, is a custom mist interpolated grid, um, which, uses spectroscop which uses initial metallicities ranging from negative 2 to 0 0.5 dex and 0 0.05 dex steps and then ages ranging anywhere from 0.1 all the way up to about 20 billion years old with logarithmic and linear spacing. Um, logarithmic at the beginning, and then as you start going to older ages, having linear spacing there. And overall, this ends up giving us roughly 7 million models within our entire um, model grid. And so you probably are wondering, well, what exactly happened to the binary main sequence here? You no longer see kind of a secondary main sequence that we were seeing beforehand in the, um, in the previous HR diagram that I showed. And the reason for this is because 
these stars have not had enough time within the age of the universe to evolve to such large radii. And even within 20 billion years or so, they still haven't had enough time um, and because they just evolve very slowly. And so therefore these models are either, either forced down onto the grid or not, these stars are either forced down onto the model grid or not fit at all. And then finally, you'll notice that there's no longer an effective temperature gap going on here, um, as, I, as I mentioned before. And this is just because we're using this uniform G minus K photometry, which we use as our effective temperature uh, to, to convert to effective temperatures. Okay, so what I want to stress is that we've got masses, ages, densities, and more for every single star within this diagram. So now that we have all these brand new stellar properties, what is it that we can actually learn about the planet population? So here I, I want to give a little bit of background on the planet radius gap, um, which comes from Fulton et al. 2017. So this is a plot of number of planets per star on the y-axis versus planet size on the x-axis. And the major discovery of this plot is this gap in the distribution of radii for small planets, separating the super-Earths down here at about 1.3 Earth radii from the sub-Neptunes up above at about 2.4 or so Earth radii. And this discovery was made possible thanks to the very precise stellar properties provided by the California Kepler survey. Now, because this is such a big discovery, um, a bunch of people have asked questions in subsequent years, such as how the gap varies as a function of incident flux orbital periods, stellar mass. And I think especially looking towards the future and something that I'm going to talk about very soon um, is how it varies as a function of stellar age. Now, we also need some sort of a mechanism to create this gap in the distribution of small planet radii. So today I'm gonna to be discussing two of the major competing theories for why this gap actually forms. The first of which is photoevaporation, which uses very high energy XUV and EUV radiation, usually within the first 100 million years of a host star's lifetime um, to then strip um, planet atmospheres because this is when the star is still very young and very active. Um, and then the second theory I wanna discuss is core powered mass loss which uses a combination of the bolometric luminosity from the host star and the core luminosity of the planet left over from its heat from formation. And the combination of those two factors actually result in atmosphere loss. Now this is expected to occur on slightly longer time scales, roughly about a giga year or so. And I'll be coming back to that in a little bit. Uh, in a little bit. But um, how do they actually compare to the observations? Um, so over here on the left, I've got models from uh, photo evaporation models from Owen and Wu 2017 showing planet radius versus orbital period, where darker colors on this plot indicate higher relative densities or higher occurrences of planets. And on the right, we've got the observations from Fulton et al 2017. And qualitatively, if we just look between these two plots, you can see that overall the colors match up with where the colors occur. Um, so there's qualitative agreement between the models and the observations in this region of parameter space. In addition, if we take a look at core powered mass loss, again, I've got the models over here on the left coming from Gupta and Schlichting 2019. Um, and the observations over here on the right. And again, darker colors in the models indicate um, darker colors in the observations. And there's relatively good qualitative agreement, I believe, between the models and the observations. So then this inevitably leads to the question, well, how would we differentiate between these two theories if both can describe the observations pretty well so far? And you might be able to think about a few different ways we could do so. You know, number one, for instance, we, want, we might want to get more precise stellar properties. Um, we also might want to, for instance, increase the number of planets that we're looking at, and we might want to look at, for instance, different areas of parameter space. And so speaking about the different areas of parameter space, we can then end up looking at um, planet radius now versus incident flux instead of orbital period. Um, and then we can also color the points here according to the stellar mass of their host star. And so the solid points on top are confirmed planets and the translucent points underneath are candidate planets. And if you've got a particularly keen eye in this diagram, you might have noticed that there's a color gradient going from right to left or left to right in this plot. And this is just due to the fact that if we naively assume that planets are occurring at roughly similar orbital periods around different mass stars, that around the more massive stars, which are also more luminous, they will also receive larger amounts of incident flux. 
Um, and so we can actually see in the center region of this diagram that this is the um, planet radius valley, which is essentially a two dimensional representation of the one dimensional planet radius gap, which separates the super Earths and sub Neptunes. So we're cl clearly seeing it in this region of the diagram, but it turns out that it's actually difficult to differentiate between photo evaporation and core powered mass loss in this exact region of parameter space. And so then we decided to ask, well, how does the planet radius valley depend on stellar age? So here, if we plot the number of planets on the y-axis versus planet radius, thing to note here is this is not occurrence rate. This is just raw number of planets. Um, on the um, bottom of the x-axis here, you can actually see um, each of these purple ticks represent this, these old planets, which are roughly older than 1 billion years old, according to the isochrone ages that we've determined for their host stars. And what we really want to know here is the relative number of super-Earths and sub-Neptunes, because this might give us an idea of how planets are evolving over time. Now, super-Earths are defined here as any planet between 1 and about 1.8 or so Earth radii all the way up to this dashed line. And then sub-Neptunes are any planet between 1.8 and about 3.5 or so Earth radii. And these are according to the definitions of Fulton et al. 2017. But if we end up counting up the number of super-Earths in that bin and the number of sub-Neptunes in that bin, um, and then we do some Monte Carlo simulations based on the uncertainties in the planet radii um, to determine their uncertainties, we end up getting unity plus or minus 0.1. Now, this value is somewhat meaningless at this point in time until we can actually compare it to the young planet distribution, which I plotted over top in green here. Now, what you'll notice is that the super Earth peak and the young planet histogram is actually significantly lower. Um, and the sub Neptune peak is significantly broader um, than what we see in the old planet distribution. Um, and so these, again, are planets that are younger than about 1 billion years old. And so if we do a similar um, computation, uh, determining that ratio and then its uncertainty, we end up with 0.61 plus or minus 0 0.09, which ends up corresponding to roughly a three or so sigma difference between the young and old planet histograms in terms of this ratio of super Earths to sub Neptunes. So, what does this ultimately suggest? Well, um, it suggests that sub Neptunes are becoming super Earths on roughly year timescales, which is one of the first times that we've empirically determined this sort of expected timescale. Um, now, originally we had thought, okay, well, this gig year time scale matches up better with core powered mass loss than it matches up with photo evaporation. However, some recent work um, by photo evaporation modelers, um, James Owen and James Rogers has actually shown that photo evaporation can produce similar sorts of behavior in the planet population on gig year time scales. So for now, the jury's out um, about exactly which theory is better describing the observations at this point in time. So, okay, I think, I think that's definitely exciting. Um, but what else, is, is, what else can we actually learn about the planet population given all of this information, additional information that we know, you know, the Kepler stellar masses, um, as well as the updated planet radii, um, stellar ages, all of that. So if we go back to this diagram, um, again, planet radius versus incident flux, and then decide to focus in on particular regions of parameter space. So this boxed region that I've highlighted here, um, I wanted to look at, for instance, planets within the hot sub-Neptunian desert, which is detailed in Lundqvist et al. 2016. Based on the analysis in that paper, it was expected that hardly any planets or zero planets should be found within this box, um, based on at least stars that had astroseismic um, constraints. Um, but we'll 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 zoom in here, and as you can see, there are definitely a few planets in there. But maybe we can we can determine exactly what's going on there if we zoom in. So if we zoom into this region of parameter space, um, we can see that this plot is kind of uh, split up into four separate regions. So over here on the right, we've got our low flux planets, um, which I've plotted in gray here. Um, these are planets that are receiving less than 650 Earth fluxes. And then on the left region, we've got our high flux planets. Um, you've got your high flux sub Saturns over here on top, your high flux super Earths down here below. And then in the center, you've got your desert planets where normally no planets should be. Um, and so you could actually see the typical uncertainties on each of these points as plotted by the, the translucent red error bars. 
But then you'll also notice that there are these little black bars that are connected to each of these points. And these actually represent the overall incident flux history that that planet has experienced over its star's lifetime. And so as the star has evolved from its zero age main sequence to where it currently is, that planet has undergone, if we assume that it's at the same orbital period and semi-major axis, that planet will have undergone um, an increase in incident flux over that period of time. And so especially if we look over here towards the right side of the diagram, you'll notice that the vast majority of planets that are currently with within the desert have actually only shifted there due to stellar evolution. And so, for instance, if they were around a star um, that would put them kind of on the right side of this diagram um, initially when it was born, um, they might have been able to, for instance, to cool and contract instead of lose their atmospheres, whether it was to very high energy XUV and EUV radiation or from just the bolometric luminosity from the host star. But there also are nine planets that we've found here um, that have been within the desert for their entire lifetimes based on what we measure here. And so these little black bars actually do not put them outside of the desert. And so there needs to be some sort of an explanation for how exactly these planets got there. And that is something that is the subject, I think, of, of definitely additional research. I also wanted to return to this planet radius incident flux diagram and take a look at some planets that are in this region here, which I'll call the cool inflated Jupiters. You also hear them called um, warm Jupiters um, because they are receiving more flux than, for instance, our own Jupiter. But if we zoom into this region of parameter space, you'll see that now we've got planet radius in terms of Jupiter radii on the y-axis and incident flux here on the x-axis. You'll see that the incident fluxes that we're dealing with here are not that much greater than what Earth currently receives. But what I want you all to focus on in this diagram is this red line, um, which represents roughly a one Jupiter mass pure hydrogen helium object at roughly solar metallicity um, and at the age of, of Earth, effectively. Um, and so this is nominally what we would expect to be the maximum radius of an object like that. And so if you take a look at some of these large colored points, you'll notice that they have uncertainty uh, bars associated with them. And that any of those uncertainty bars, which could place them below this red line, um, is indicative of, you know, they, they could be consistent with that sort of maximum expected radius. However, there are a few points here that are actually significantly above that line. The first of which is Kepler 468b, which you'll notice as this purple point here. Now, the purple, the purple color actually indicates the overall age of the host star of that planet, which you'll see is relatively young, roughly about 2 billion years old or so. It's also been circled, which is indicative of it having UV excess um, relative to um, its, its, for instance, absolute magnitude, and um, it has rapid rotation. Um, you can see where this host star is located in this inset HR diagram in the upper right-hand corner here. Um, but what you'll notice is it is significantly above this, this, this red line here, which is the maximum radius that we would expect a Jupiter or so sized planet. Um, now, you'll notice that, uh, that Kepler 468b, because it is around a young star, we might be able to say something along the lines of, well, it might still be cooling and contracting from its heat from formation. Um, it's still somewhat inflated because of that. But you know, over time, we might expect it to essentially shift to being below this line. But the other planet that is significantly above that line in this plot is this Kepler 706b, which you'll notice is colored yellow. Um, and yellow on this age color bar um, is over 16 billion years old, which is older than the age of the universe. So what exactly is going on there? So this, this object is definitely subject to additional research. It's something that I'm currently working on. Um, but the thing to note is that typically when we see stars that have ages above the age of the universe, these are most likely going to be binary stars. And so Kepler 706, the star might actually have a stellar companion, which is pushing up its determined isochrone age. Um, and so that is going to be subject to additional scrutiny, certainly. Okay, and then I wanted to talk also about some other recent related work that has actually used some of my catalogs. 
So here is a plot from um, Steve Bryson's uh, first paper in 2020, um, which shows the planet radius on the y-axis versus orbital period on the x-axis. The color, um, the shaded colors in this plot show the overall completeness of planets of um, determination of planets in different regions of parameter space. And then the colors of the planets themselves as these points are according to their reliability, how reliable are their properties, how likely it is, are they planets? Um, and um, what you'll notice is that um, in these different regions of parameter space, F1 um, and Psi Earth, um, you'll notice that there are a certain number of planets in each of those boxes. Now, what I want to stress is that this is as of DR25, um, based on the stellar properties of the Mathur et al. stellar properties catalog. So this is before Gaia DR2. Now, how do things actually change when we implement Gaia DR2 um, stellar properties? Well, we see that things change pretty significantly and that the number of planets in each of those boxes actually decrease. So what exactly does this say? Well, I think what it says is that stellar properties are going to have a significant effect on our occurrence rates. And it is also extremely important to take into account that both the target star samples and the host star samples are being determined with similar stellar properties and similar, um, you know, uh, like doing things homogeneously. Um, and so therefore, you know, it's important that we really get the most precise stellar properties when we're considering things such as, you know, the occurrence rates of Earth-like planets, for instance. Um, and so that was one sort of um, result of uh, the Gaia Kepler stellar properties catalog. But then also um, some recent work um, by an RE student that I worked with um, this past summer, Linnea Wolniewicz, um, she ended up doing work on determining what the Kepler target selection function actually looked like. Um, and she did this by using Gaia, effectively Gaia DR2, um, to then determine the properties of both the Kepler target stars, but then also the other stars that were on the Kepler CCDs that Kepler decided not to observe. Um, and so kind of in these top plots, um, you'll notice that there are these um, Kepler magnitudes less than 11, less than 12, less than 13. And the points here are colored according to the percentage of, that was chosen to be observed by Kepler and what the Kepler team chose to observe. So if we take a look at this Kepler magnitude less than 13 or so plot, you'll see that the vast majority of stars at Kepler magnitudes less than 13 were observed um, because Kepler could effectively observe all those brightest stars. However, as you start to go deeper, um, you notice that some decisions started having to be made. And so if you go all the way to this Kepler magnitude less than 16 or so diagram, you notice that the colors start getting somewhat brighter. And that, for instance, for a star like our sun, um, which you know, was obviously one of the main goals of the Kepler mission, um, you'll notice that this region is somewhat brighter and purple, more purpley orange rather than black. Um, and this is just because some hard decisions had to be made. And in particular, at this exact effective temperature, it's very difficult to tell the difference between, for instance, a sun radius star and a subgiant star with a similar effective temperature. Um, and so you'll notice here that they tended to do better um, as you start going a little bit down the main sequence, especially as you start going down to K, um, to K dwarfs. Um, because it was actually much easier to tell the difference between those K-dwarfs and the, for instance, giant stars that you see up above. Um, and so that's why you're kind of seeing this darker purple region here for stars that are cooler than the sun, because it was easier to differentiate between, for instance, the giant and the dwarf stars versus um, what we are getting dwarf and subgiant stars uh, for, for solar type stars. So, you know, definitely go and check out that paper if you're interested about, you know, what stars Kepler chose, how well um, the Kepler target selection function ended up working. Okay, and then um, I kind of want to finish up with some past and also some of my planned work with stellar ages. So here we've got a diagram of stellar radius versus effective temperature that I've shown a lot today. But now, so this is the Kepler host star sample. And I've colored the points according to their maximum age uncertainty. So the maximum age uncertainty of their upper or lower bound. Um, and darker points here indicate lower max age uncertainties or more precise determinations. And brighter colors indicate less precise determinations. 
Now, where exactly do isochrones do really well? Well, unsurprisingly, isochrone ages are very precise in this upper left-hand region of this diagram, in particular for the more massive stars, which evolve very quickly, and for the subgiant stars, which also evolve pretty quickly across the HR diagram. But then as you start to go and move down the main sequence, you see that things get less and less precise because those stars do not move as quickly within the stellar, re stellar radius effective temperature region of parameter space. And so isochrone ages are not very useful as you start moving down the main sequence. Now, what you'll notice here is that there are some gray points, and I've actually colored these gray because we effectively cannot determine their ages with any precision um, because these stars have not had enough time within the age of our maximum age of our grid, which is 20 giga years, to evolve off the main sequence. And so therefore, there's no way that we can really determine their ages through isochrones um, really at all, um, especially in for these gray stars. Now you'll notice that I've also circled the giant branch here, and I will definitely caution the use of our of the giant properties in our catalog, um, largely because these giant properties have been done much, much better um, in the various papers um, through Apogee and the um, through the Apocask sample of stars. So stars that have astroseismic constraints um, and really taken into account those astroseismic constraints as well as well-determined sp stellar spectra and detailed analyses of both of those things to get very precise stellar properties. Because the problem with the giant branch is if you get either the effective temperature or the metallicity wrong, depending on where you occur on that giant branch will shift you very significantly in terms of the stellar age that you determine. Because if you're on the right side, you're expected to spend a long time on the main sequence. And if you're on the left side, you're expected to spend very shortly on the main sequence. Um, and so that's kind of something to keep in mind about the giant ages there. Um, and then finally, I just want to point out that there are definitely some old edge of grid models that might not be all that reliable, you know, towards kind of the top end of the main sequence slash, you know, as you start getting some turnoff stars um, kind of towards the maximum age of the universe. Um, so if we want to sum all of this stuff up, um, and in particular, try to figure out where age indicators are optimal throughout the HR diagram, I'm trying to summarize this here. So isochrones are pretty effective, as I mentioned before, in this upper left-hand region of the diagram that I've got circled here. Um, but we also want to use other age indicators where we can be more effective at different types of stars. And so here, um, I've also plotted where lithium abundances are typically effective. Um, so some background on lithium abundances. This is actually some work that I did uh, towards the beginning of grad school. I'm working on the um, California Kepler survey and determining lithium abundances of the California Kepler survey, Kepler planet host stars. Um, and then on this plot, so the Kepler planet host stars are in red. And then in blue is the empirical isochrone of the Hyades um, from Bozgard et al. 2016, which represents an age of roughly 650 million years. Now, the thing to note about lithium abundances is we expect them to start off at roughly the same level, somewhere around 3.1 or so um, on this plot. And then subsequently, we expect them to be reduced um, because lithium is burned at temperatures greater than about 2.5 million Kelvin. Um, because stars end up convecting lithium into their interiors and that it is burned in their interiors. So it turns out that the less massive stars with deeper convective envelopes actually burn through lithium more quickly than the more massive stars with, with shallower convective envelopes. And so given all this information at a particular effective temperature, you can actually end up using a curve like the Hyades to determine whether or not a star is younger or older um, based on whether or not, you know, your lithium abundances is, is above the Hyades. Um, and so, for instance, all these stars that are above the Hyades are going to be younger and all the stars that are below are going to be older. So how exactly does this translate into planet properties? And so um, here we've got fraction of planets on the y-axis and planet radius on the x-axis, and we've got these two separate histograms in purple and green. And what you'll notice is in this one bin here, there are many more sub-Neptunes in the young bin than there are in the old bin, which is plotted kind of underneath. Um, and this actually matches up pretty well with some of the um, 
with this with the discovery that I talked about a little bit earlier about you know sub Neptunes becoming super Earths on those giga year or so timescales. And so we're even seeing that this here with a different age indicator. Um, in addition, uh, we we can use astro seismology to very very well constrain the ages of stars, especially on the giant branch and moving into kind of sub giant stars in some cases. Um, UV excess can be particularly useful for roughly solar type stars, particularly those that are younger, um, because this is when they're still very young and very active, and so they produce a lot of excess UV radiation. Um, rotation can be used for stars kind of throughout the main sequence, although I think for M dwarfs, you're st you still have to be careful about some of the um, calibrations for those types of stars. Um, and then kinematics can roughly be used for pretty much all stars throughout the HR diagram, although you do need en ensembles of stars to help determine um, their rough kinematic ages. So wrapping all of this stuff up into one diagram, what different age indicators do we have for all the different stars within this diagram? And so each of the different colored points um, are shown here. So green are isochrone ages, red are astroseismic ages, and so on. But you'll see that the number of stars that have isochrone constraints, the number of stars that have astroseismic constraints within the Kepler field, UV rotation and lithium. Um, you'll also notice that uh, the, 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 the actual star shaped points um, are stars that I actually have follow up with um, uh, observing on Mauna Kea. So Keck NERC 2 AO imaging follow up, as well as Subaru HDS um, spectroscopic follow up. Um, and the purposes of those are essentially to either measure lithium abundances with the Subaru HDS, potentially find potential spectroscopic binaries in some cases that could make the stars seem to masquerade as young in some cases. And then also to look at AO imaging to see if we can find any binary companions, um, which could then end up allowing those stars to masquerade as young stars in some cases. And so overall, we can use all of this information to really hammer down the properties and the ages of stars at various regions of parameter space. Because as of what I've really shown so far, at least with the determination of the isochrone ages, we're mostly getting stars kind of in this upper left-hand region of the diagram. And so we really want to get ages of stars throughout a broader range of stellar types um, to really see if that gap um, and the fact that sub-Neptunes become super Earths does hold up um, with that broader sample. Um, and then I want to talk about some of my planned applications to K2 and tests with Gaia EDR3. Um, and so here again, I've got another HR diagram showing stellar radius and effective temperature. And underneath in gray, I've got essentially the host star sample from Kepler. Um, and then over top, I've plotted essentially the Kepler, K2, and TESS combined stellar samples. And on top, I've got typical histograms for each of these different stellar types. And what you'll notice is that for Kepler, you know, there are a lot of FGK stars, unsurprisingly. But um, with K2 and TESS, they really do add a number of stars within the A type and the M type. And so when we start thinking about, for instance, how planets vary as a function of stellar mass, this is really going to give us additional um, sort of lever arms to, uh, to, to look at those sorts of properties. Um, and so if we end up uh, looking at just the overall planet population, again, in gray is what we had with Kepler, roughly 4,000 or so planets. Um, but then in blue, uh, we've got the combination of Kepler, K2, and TESS, and we can see that the number of planets is significantly increasing um, when we combine all the planets that we know and all the, the candidate planets that we've got with K2 and TESS to the Kepler sample. And when we determine them homogeneously using Gaia EDR3, um, this could end up you know, giving us a lot of information into some of the interesting formation processes and the formation and evolution of these exoplanets. So to just kind of sum up some of the science cases for all of this additional work um, with uh, Kepler, K2, and TESS sort of combined samples. Um, I really want to continue to look at planets within the hot sub-Neptunian desert and really see, you know, additional information about how they formed, whether or not they're still, you know, whether there's an additional planets within that region with K2 and TESS. Um, in addition, um, are there planets really within the valley here? Um, now, the planets within the valley are an interesting population of planets because 
based on some work by Vincent Van Eylen, he's shown that or suggested that essentially there, if, if we determine the properties of the planets very precisely, you know, run their um, like transit fitting pipelines based on the mean stellar density from the host star that you wouldn't find any planets within the valley and it would actually be completely empty. And so the key is with Gaia EGR3, run all these planets through um, with the most precise stellar properties, determine which ones are truly within the valley after that work, and then refit their transits and see if they remain within the valley with the updated mean stellar densities, which can actually inform the sort of transit fitting pipelines that we use to determine planet properties such as RP over our star and everything else. And so it's going to be interesting to see whether or not planets still remain within the valley or whether it is actually carved out a little bit more thanks to um, the updated stellar properties that we now have. Um, because I think at this point, we are more limited by uncertainties in our transit fitting pipelines than we are in the actual stellar properties. And then finally, um, as I've mentioned before, how the valley depends on stellar mass and age, we're going to have additional information about that using the K2 and TESS um, planet samples, um, because we're going to have that wider range of A and M type stars. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about some things that I'm also excited to support while at um, NASA Goddard. Um, so I'm excited to support, you know, all the various space missions, um, JWST, the Roman Space Telescope, um, and the sorts of like target selection, for instance, um, for, for, for potential host stars for planets. Um, and then also, you know, you can kind of think about your science being here. I am very happy to provide, you know, precise stellar properties for any sort of star that you're interested in. Um, and so these are all these are all things that I'm I'm super excited about um, as as an incoming um, MPP fellow at NASA Goddard. So with that, I just kind of want to leave you all with a quote, um, which comes from David Soderbloom's uh, 2010 pa paper on the review of stellar ages. So one of the first questions we will ask um, if we discover a planet with a biosignature is how old is that system? And I think a lot of the work that I've shown here and a lot of the work that I plan to do um, is going to go into answering that question, at least with more precision than what we, um, than what we have had in the past, um, as well as just the overall exoplanet demographics angle of things. And so, you know, looking at the um, formation and evolution of exoplanet systems and exoplanet demographics um, is, is definitely going to give us a piece of this overall puzzle. So with that, I'm going to leave up my uh, summary slide. Uh, thank you for your time and I will take any questions now. Have an amazing talk, Chris. Excellent. It's very, very good, especially the the dependence of the of the age and the distribution of a uh, super Earth and mini Neptune. I think it's uh, really, uh, really interesting. Yeah. So we can start the question. I think we had um, Rick that had a question first. Yeah. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, Travis, nice talk. Really nice. Um, you, you sort of addressed my question in your sort of summary when you were talking about RP over R star mm -hmm. and your hot sub Neptunian desert, you had sort of larger air bars on the planet radii there, but I'm sort of wondering in your work, like what's the general improvement in the planet radius as we know the stellar ages? Where do you see the trend sort of going in, in, in constraining planet radii with your research? Yeah, yeah. So I think ultimately, um, so there's actually a lot of work that's being done right now by uh, Jason Rowe um, in using all of the, for instance, Kepler stellar properties. So from the most recent Kepler stellar properties catalogs and refitting planet transits. And so one of the biggest issues right now is I think we've got the stellar properties pretty well constrained, at least thanks to Gaia DR2 parallaxes, right? Because that gets us, you know, that allows us to determine where a star is located in terms of stellar radius and then therefore kind of stellar age 
gives us those sorts of constraints a little bit better now than what we were getting beforehand. So now, like for instance, if you were to try to plot, you know, for instance, the planet radius gap plot um, for just the entire planet population and update it with, you know, for instance, more precise Gaia parallaxes or something like that. So for instance, I've done a little bit of work on using Gaia EDR3 to determine the properties of the um, Kepler uh, host star sample and not many changes happen there. Um, and I think even if you were to increase the precision, you know, if, if they were to become significantly more precise, what we would see is that the planet population doesn't really change all that much. And so right now, I think we are definitely dominated by uncertainties in the actual transit fitting pipelines. Um, and a large reason for that is um, being able to constrain the, for instance, the mean stellar density that we input into those 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 pipelines. Um, and so being able to have, so there was a recent paper by um, uh, Eric Pettigura, which ended up showing um, effectively that you can uh, like clear out the, the sort of planet radius gap location by just providing, for instance, some constraints on, for instance, the eccentricities, um, as well as like, for instance, the mean stellar densities for the host stars. And that combination of things can actually end up getting you more precise or more reasonable um, RP over R star values than what we are currently seeing. Because what we've seen is actually, it turns out that the RP over R star values, which were determined, um, their uncertainties, I think, are somewhat underestimated, at least in the in the general, like, you know, the KOI table from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, for instance. Um, and so the, the we're dominated currently by those uncertainties and those RP over R star values. Interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we have a question also from Estelle. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Estelle. Um, yes, uh, I am not familiar with the concept of photo evaporation and uh, co-powered mass loss, mm -hmm. but can we imagine some sort of convolution to explain that they both uh, explain the hypothesis or are they mutually exclusive of each other? Um, um, so I, I think you're absolutely right. It could be some sort of convolution. Um, and obviously, you know, those are just two of the theories that have been used to describe what we're seeing in the planet population. But keep in mind, those are just, you know, two of the kind of more tested theories at this point in time. But there could be any sort of explanation for exactly why that that gap is forming in the planet population. Um, but it, most likely it is probably some combination of the two. Okay, thank you. Uh, Eric? Hey, uh, thanks, Travis. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I'm, of course, also really interested in the um, sub-Neptune planets in the in the hot Neptune desert. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious of the, the the nine planets you identified that had been there over their their whole stellar lifetime. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of uh, what stellar masses are they around? Um, gotcha. Um, so. That is a good question. I haven't actually looked into those. It's been a while since I've actually looked at those planets themselves. Um, but if we, let me actually just go back to this plot here. Um, I believe, so the stellar masses that we're looking at there, I think they're, they're if you look at the colors of some of these planets here, um, you'll see that they're somewhat, I guess, somewhat higher somewhere between you know roughly solar mass and slightly higher than solar mass um but uh yeah i i, I can't okay. give you a definitive answer i'm just taking a look at the plot and exactly where the planets are located here no, so. no, that, that's fine just uh, yeah something to look at going forward because naively my prediction would be mm -hmm. i would expect them to be around earlier stellar types because if it is photo evaporation then of course what matters isn't the bolometric incident flux, it's the UV, uh, the lifetime integrated uh, UV flux, and that right. has a significant stellar type dependence. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's something that uh, that I will definitely look into, and I might be able to have an answer for you pretty soon. So I, okay, I wouldn't fantastic. be, I think, I think, I, I think you're on to something there, though. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you want um, any help with uh, going from uh, incident stellar fluxes to like lifetime uh, XGV flux. Um, uh, there's also some papers I can point you to that would help with that. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So thanks, Eric. Vlad? Yes, hello, um, uh, Travis. Very nice talk. Thanks for 
this uh, great introduction to ages of um, planet hosts. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question that I have, the first uh, two questions, the first one is that when you show the, um, uh, the uh, planet radi uh, 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 radius gap, you know, mm -hmm. Fulton gap, so uh, uh, is there any, what is the, what's fraction of uh, Kepler planets are uh, uh, have the um, radial velocity observations and do we see some kind of a gap you know uh, uh, in masses of those planets or it's only in radii so um that's that's the first question yeah um, yeah so so that that's absolutely a good question when you start thinking about things such as the masses of those planets i will say that i myself i am like i have not worked very much with planet masses at least throughout my own work um but what i will say is I think roughly uh, what fraction, it's probably about like, at least with precise, um, precisely determined masses. And if you're asking about what fraction of like, I guess, sub-Neptune size planets or so, um, right. I think you're probably talking about like only, there's only a few, I would guess only a few hundred at this point that, that really have well-determined um, planet masses for because it's obviously very difficult to determine um, the the masses, especially of, of Kepler of Kepler planets because they're around relatively dim stars, um, and you're talking about relatively small um, semi amplitudes for for those planets around you know um, different type stars. Um, so, but you know, feel free to correct me. I'm not uh, somewhere around a few hundred, which is you know obviously uh, I don't know. I don't know exactly what percentage that is, but you know, you're talking about thousands of planets within the Kepler sample. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and, and the second question is that when you show this um, um, uh, a diagram, a plot for the um, ages versus different methods, so mm -hmm. including lithium, um, yep. I noticed that um, you know the uh, starting from K-type stars, we don't see a lot of uh, a lot of lithium measurements or detection. Yeah. Yep. Why is that? Is that the, the is that no no detections or no measurements? So it's 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 effectively no detection. So as you'll notice in this plot here, um, you start to see these little uh, downward arrows, um, and those are essentially just upper limits. So no detections of lithium. You're you're starting to get into K-type stars over here, and there's hardly any K-type stars that have actually detected lithium. And the reason for that is just because these stars burn through their lithium abundances so quickly. Um, that it's really, really difficult uh, to, to measure. They have to be young for us to truly measure lithium. And so these stars that do have measured lithium are probably those that we can be more um, confident about being young stars um, just because they burn through their lithium so quickly. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Vlad. So Michelle is next and after Robbie. Awesome. Awesome stuff. I'm a fan of stellar parameters, but I have mostly focused on MDORF. So I'm, and now, you know, you're apparently going to be here with a bunch of MDORF people. How are you thinking about tying all that together? And if you already covered it, sorry, I missed it. But yeah, yeah. So this is something that, um, you know, so previous Kepler stellar properties catalogs um, have had issues with MDORFs um, just because MDORFs have been, you know, MDORFs are difficult, as you know. Um, <laughs> and so, one of the things that we were really careful to do at least, and I, I kind of skipped over this um, in my, let me actually see if I can actually, let me zoom out here and just go to an image here. So this is the, um, you know, the, the HR diagram with all the Kepler target sample. And then you've got your MDORFs that are down over here. Um, one of the things that we were careful to do was actually replace. So for instance, the MIST models do not do well at all for MDORF type stars. Um, and so one of the things we did was uh, actually replace the MIST models effectively with empirical relations from Andrew Mann's papers in 2015 and 2019. So the, M, uh, the absolute K-band magnitude um, uh, stellar radius and stellar mass relations, as well as um, color temperature relations there. Mm -hmm. um, and so determining those, those sorts of, you know, more precise, I think, uh, uh, MDORF, or better determined MDORF properties for those stars. And that's actually something that, you know, I'm currently working on right now is really trying to make sure, like, for instance, looking towards the future, um, the Gaia EDR3 using the Gaia 
um, photometric bands to be able to just do Kepler K2 and tests all together using BP RP um, and making sure that the effective temperatures, the masses and the radii of MDORFs actually match up with what we measure empirically. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm currently working on and trying to make sure that the model grid that we're using actually matches up well by using these empirical relations. Um, are you then, using no, like, I'm a, hmm? sorry, go ahead. Are you using what model grid? Are you going to use like BT settle or is there something newer? Or you mean um, like isochrone still? Because so okay. at this point, I'm um, still using uh, the like, for instance, the mist model grid, but then mm -hmm replacing the sorts of like radii uh, masses um, uh, and using those empirical relations to kind of okay. dictate what's going on instead of that. Also trying to implement something I'm also thinking about doing is increasing the number of model grids that my current code base uses. So I use isoclassify, which was um, written originally by my advisor, Dan Huber. Um, and this, this code works very, very quickly. But the, the problem is right now it can only use missed models and being able to use other model grids is definitely something that I think is in, in, the, in the docket for, uh, for future updates. Um, and so, you know, there are limitations obviously with, with different model grids. So, yeah. Awesome, really exciting, cool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michelle and Robbie. Hey, Travis, um, I'm a big fan of your work. This is a great talk. And you actually touched on my question um, mm -hmm. right at the end there. Uh, but I was wondering if you could maybe speak about what the model limitations are for yep. different grids, how that might change, and also if there's any calibrations that uh, you see coming in the near term future that would improve these models. Yeah, yeah. So that, that is a fantastic question. You know, I think one of the key things to keep in mind is that the, um, you know, my advisor uh, is, is that essentially you know, the models aren't the ground truth. Um, we can use them to determine very interesting things such as ages and that sort of stuff. But there are obviously a lot of limitations of those model grids. So I've already touched on something at least with using isochrones, right? The ages of MDORF stars and that sort of stuff. We can't determine the ages of MDORF stars using model grids. And so therefore that sort of information is effectively useless. But then, you know, I think, I think other limitations of model grids um, include, um, uh, like I've some things that I'm thinking about doing are for some of the more sort of like massive stars. And luckily this isn't a huge problem for um, the majority of host stars because most of them are FGK. But the problem is the further you go away from sort of solar type models, the more you're kind of going into regions of parameter space that are a little bit more difficult to constrain. Um, and so, um, you know, really, really caring about things such as, you know, which model grids, what sort of um, uh, like physical constraints that they use, like, you know, for instance, mixing length um, and helium abundances and all that sort of stuff. Um, all of that is incredibly important for dictating, you know, where a model grid is, where exactly the red giant branch is and all that sort of stuff. And so like, for instance, I'm, I'm not sure how much I truly believe you know, for instance, the stellar ages of stars on the red giant branch, right? Um, because we're just using, you know, uh, instead of using like astroseismic constraints um, and doing a, a very detailed study of those, such as the Apocasque catalogs have done for, for, for um, astroseismic stars within the Kepler field, that's something that, you know, for instance, the model missed I think messes up exactly where where the giant branch is and slash the input properties sometimes can 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 mess you up. Um, so, you know, I think in the future, implementing more model grids and actually seeing, you know, where the problems are different between different model grids, you know, certain things are well decided. Um, but then where the model grids really differ are where the model systematics are largest, right? And so being able to actually understand the sorts of uncertainties of models in those various areas of parameter space. So for instance, um, Jamie Tyar, um, who's currently here at the University of Hawaii, she's done a lot of work on actually using a variety of different model grids and figuring out the typical uncertainties associated with stars in different regions of parameter space based on how different the models are in those different regions of parameter space. And so that's all stuff that's kind of going into this, this overall 
determination of uncertainties um, and that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Robbie. So I have a, maybe a naive question, but uh, have you looked at the impact of the distance of the star on the impact that the GR2 has on your different results, the HR diagram? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so um, so like effectively this. Like the, the impact of like, uh, uh, could you repeat the, the, the question, please? The, so the, 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 if you have the impact of the distance of the system from us on the, the impact that DR2 has on your, on your results. Ah, okay, I see. Um, I, I have not looked into that in any sort of great detail. Um, so one thing I will note is that the, the, the difference from DR2 to, DR, to EDR3 um, is obviously much smaller than the difference from DR, Gaia DR1 to Gaia DR2. Um, but that difference from DR2 to EDR3 is actually much, the differences are much smaller for those stars that are much closer than the ones that are further away. And the okay. reason for that, again, is just due to the fact that, you know, you've got this set uncertainty that Gaia has for an individual parallax to a particular star. And so therefore those stars that are closer are going to have larger parallaxes. And so therefore that uncertainty is not really going to change the parallax very much for those stars that are within, you know, for instance, 500 parsecs versus those that are a thousand parsecs away. Um, so that's something something to keep in mind, but at least in terms of um, you know the actual distances to the stars, um, how much those have changed versus the distances that we were getting beforehand. I have not looked into an actual one to one comparison of like for instance the distances that that we had before Gaia DR two versus the distances that we have now, but I can say that at least based on these two plots here and looking at the subgiant stars. That's probably a good place to look overall because guess because before we were assuming that many of these stars were more kind of main sequence, whereas now we're finding more subgiant stars, which indicates that the stars are actually further away now than they were previously expected to be. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. It's fantastic. Yeah, I, I recall also that. I think uh, two years ago or so, a uh, paper from Stephen Kane that basically I think he was looking to different systems, the like Trappist one. LHS 1140, and I think Trappist one basically they had uh, the impact was most not too big. I think the change in the radius of the planet was like three percent, but yeah. for the other LHS 1140 was 40 percent. Yeah, um, and they are both roughly at the same distance, 12 parsec. But yeah, that that massive change will change completely our uh, atmospheric simulation that we do with our models. So it's very very important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, I think it's probably time to wrap up again. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, I think we are really looking forward to, to welcome you at Godard and, and to work with you. And um, for everyone else, so we will meet again in two weeks. Uh, we have a talk by Benjamin Edwards that will discuss uh, water worlds. So see you in two weeks. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you Bye. Thanks, Travis. Yeah, see, thank you. see you soon. See you soon. Okay, bye. Bye.